The first year of the Succession Wars had proven itself to be one of the most destructive in the history of the Inner Sphere. Every faction had already made use of weapons of mass destruction, and there was nothing to prevent their continued proliferation. Many invaders had shown zero regard for innocent lives by targeting population centres in an effort to drive out defenders, while other even more contemptible commanders made the killing of civilians an objective in itself. Despite being only a diversionary campaign, the largest battle of the war so far had taken place at Skondia between the Draconis Combine and Lyran Commonwealth. Archon Jennifer Steiner had launched raids deep into Kyritan territory to relieve the pressure on the besieged world. Though Skondia had fallen, the massive damage to the shipyards at the capitals of Dieron and Luthien had proven a humiliation for coordinator Minoru Kyrita. Now, the survivors of the Skondia invasion fleet were gearing up for a deep raid of their own against the Commonwealth's largest industrial world, Hesperus. Operation Broken Blade was launched in December 2787. Taisho Pedersen again had command of the fleet, though combat losses had reduced its size almost by half. Furthermore, with the campaign against the Federated Sons now in full swing, he had far fewer supporting units to call on. The ground attack was to be led by two of the elite Sword of Light regiments, plus another regular and one mercenary command. They were evenly matched by four LCAF Battlemech regiments and the largest naval flotilla hosted by any non-capital system within the Commonwealth. Confident that he had sufficient ground forces to counter any landing force, Admiral Weisskopf instead focused all his attention on the approaching Draconis Combined Admiralty bringing to bear the combined might of more than a dozen cruisers. Having expected the defenders to make at least some attempts to intercept the dropships, they did not. The lighter Curitan vessels found themselves dangerously positioned and outgunned. The initial engagement cost them dearly, and it was all they could do to harass the victorious Steiner fleet in an effort to stop them launching orbital strikes of their own. All four of the DCMS regiments had made landfall, but the mountainous terrain on Hesperus meant their landing sites were often far from their intended targets. As they entered orbit, they also discovered to their dismay that the Archon had commenced a massive relocation effort for the factories on Weld, moving many either underground or into caverns within the mountains. Focusing instead on the facilities that still remained on the surface, their approach led them into extensive fortifications and weapons emplacements that inflicted brutal losses on the attackers. Only the Sword of Light regiments escaped off world when Pedersen called for a withdrawal a month later. So ended the First Battle of Hesperus. Their raid had resulted in the destruction of the orbital facilities, but what little damage was inflicted to the factories on the surface was repaired within the year. The Draconis Combine would raise the battle mech factories on Sudeten and Yed Posteria the following month, but wouldn't trouble Steiner again for some time. The Tamar Tigers launched their own reprisal raids against Pomme de Terre and Styx, after which the Combine Commonwealth Front went quiet for the next year. The Capellans made the last of their strikes against the Corwood Davian worlds around this time, taking Addix, Anka, and Small World in January 2788. This minor campaign had won them several systems but cost a pair of mech regiments. The Deneb Light Cavalry had fought hard against their approach, and on several occasions the Seacaf turned to nuclear weapons to clear out defences. They also secured the Terran system of Xian, but ousting the nobility resulted in the Loyal Planetary Guard establishing their own mercenary regiment and signing on with the Federated Sons as the Xian Hotheads. With the complete takeover of the Clovis Combat Region, a new border had been established between the Capellan Confederation and Draconis Combine. The former extended an olive branch and proposed a limited alliance, or at least a mutual non-aggression pact. Unfortunately, the Kiritans smarted at the fact that several systems in their campaign path had been stolen from right under their noses. The Combine declared that they would only consider an alliance on the condition that Minoru Kirita be acknowledged as First Lord of the Star League. They also demanded the Seacaf launch an immediate attack along the Capellan March border. The Confederation was not prepared to acquiesce on either request. It would be decades before another offer of truce was made between the successor states. 
Barbara Liao's main focus remained the reversing of the Free World's invasion of her realm. For the past several months, a massive armada of warships and dropships had been gathering at Cyan, now consisting of over a hundred vessels, supported by a dozen aerospace regiments and twelve brigades of mixed ground forces. Commanding this new task force was Colonel Jason Devlin. In late February, the Chancellor gave the order to depart for the League border. Captain General Kenyon Malik remained unaware of the coming storm. His forces at the front were still pinned down after the loss of their naval escort. A trio of warships stationed at New Delos were the first to be moved forwards in preparation, something which Mashkarovka agents within the FWLM relayed back to Liao. While a rescue operation was organised, he turned his attention coreward. Throughout the first two months of 2788, Paul Steiner had dispatched the Stealth's mercenary regiment on raids against House Marek, eliminating several major industrial sites at Thermopylae and Wyatt. Later in the year, they were permanently reassigned to Amanda Lestrade's command. The Bolan Thumb allowed Kenyon to manoeuvre forces deep into the Commonwealth, and when they struck at Duantier in reprisal that March, they used nuclear weapons to obliterate the defenders before they had a chance to escape. These actions would soon be reversed on the civilians of the Free Worlds League tenfold. On the Draconis Fedsun's border, First Prince John Davian was taking stock of the calamity that had befallen his nation. The Combine had made massive inroads into the realm. Dozens of regiments were cut off behind the front line, and as the DCMS advanced, garrison forces moved in behind them to finish off the isolated defenders at their leisure. In a desperate attempt to raise new units to help defend the beleaguered state, the premier military academies formed new cadet cutters from their training mechs and rushed them into service with the AFFS. Sakara at the front had mobilised its entire student body out of necessity, while Albion and New Avalon took to reserve roles that allowed more established forces to move forwards. The Curitans had paused their campaign while they geared up for a second wave. They appeared to be waiting for the coordinator to return to the front after he had disappeared to parts unknown earlier in the year. Davian did have a plan to blunt the invasion, however. He had gathered around him some of the most elite forces within his realm, originally with the intention of striking at the Capellan Confederation, but now this force was ready to redeploy against the Curitans. Unfortunately, with the Capellan seizing nine worlds of their own in recent months, he couldn't afford to leave the Chesterton region undefended. Instead, he siphoned off three of his best and paired them with six infantry and armour regiments from the Marlet combat region. Operation Solar Shield, as the counter-attack would become known, departed for the front line in February. They were ill-prepared for what they were about to stumble into. There were just five warships in escort, and none of the new task forces had time to train together before they made their assault. The shortage of available warships was a major obstacle for the Federated Sons. That February, the First Prince moved against Terran-aligned Boeing Interstellar to seize the new Megaplex at Galax. He could not afford to have this vital facility sitting idle any longer. Control of the new Federated Boeing was given to Euston McCorkendale, making the trusted noble house one of the wealthiest in the Inner Sphere. The pressure was clearly getting to the AFFS High Command, and nowhere is this more apparent than in their ill-conceived decision to launch Operation Brass Ring the following month. The Draconis Combine had tried and failed to destroy the facilities on Hesperus. It had cost them considerably, and achieved very little. In a baffling strategic blunder, the Federated Sons decided that they could do better. Attacking unprovoked, a realm with which they shared no bad blood since the Age of War centuries earlier. Perhaps the hope was to make the Draconis Combine divert some attention against the weakened Lyran Commonwealth, but the reality was that it served only to divert forces that were desperately needed to hold back the Dragon. Only eight warships of the Federated Sun's Navy could be found to escort the raiders to Hesperus. When they arrived in late March, they were confronted by the survivors of the prior naval battle, a little over 20 Lyran vessels. Rear Admiral Hayes attempted to use speed as his only advantage, and was able to open a brief window which allowed a battalion of troops to make landfall after a week of skirmishing in space. 
The alert had long since gone out though, giving the Hesperus guards more than enough time to muster and quickly dispatch the raiders. The AFFS called off the attack in April, having achieved nothing of note. They lingered in the dark space of the Terran hegemony for over a year, licking their wounds. Later that month, the CCAF's Task Force Devlin appeared in the New Delos system. They had moved through occupied space without drawing attention to themselves by using cracked codes retrieved by the Mashkarovka. New Delos had been the site where the Capellan Confederation and Free Wells League had put their past grievances to bed at the end of the Second Andurian War. This time, the entire armada descended on the planet, which had only a single green regiment to defend it. They made landfall around the capital city, cutting off any escape routes, then gave those within just eight hours to surrender the world. They didn't bother to wait for a response, and launched mass bombing raids soon after. Approximately 20,000 were killed, and more than 200,000 were wounded. The Orlov Grenadiers tried to stop the killing, but were themselves wiped out by the overwhelming Capellan numbers. The orders Colonel Devlin had received from Barbara Liao left no doubt in his mind what the objective of this raid was. The killing of civilians took priority over the destruction of the various staging posts and supply depots supporting the Marek militia campaign. And yet, however brutal the attack on New Delos had been, the true horror of the First Succession War was about to be realised in the nearby Stuart Commonality. In early May 2788, a pair of warships appeared in the helm system, escorting a mech regiment of the Draconis Combine Mustard Soldiery. With them was the missing coordinator, Minoru Kirita. Most of the Stuart Dragoons had long since been redeployed to the Capellan Front, leaving only a small militia force in garrison. They alerted the defenders to their presence when they launched a nuclear weapon at the forces camped at Fort Albert on the 11th of May. What followed was a brutal campaign against the survivors and civilian population, as the Draconis Combine searched frantically for the SLDF secret base within the Nagayan Mountains. Nothing was off limits if it resulted in the discovery of the hidden cache. Civilians were rounded up, interrogated and tortured in an effort to locate it. Eventually, their lack of success led them to detonate a nuclear weapon within the capital, Freeport. By the 28th, the DTMS was pulling back, having determined that the weapons cache had either been emptied by the FWLM or the SLDF before them, or was simply a myth. As the Taisho departed for orbit, he contacted the coordinator to inform him that they had failed to locate the secret base. Minoru's response was to order his fleet to chastise the local population for their lack of assistance. Olav Nansen gave the order, and began the Ghost Rain Protocol. Their full arsenal of nuclear ordnance and naval batteries was unleashed on Helm's major population centres. In less than an hour, approximately 10 million civilians were killed, the greatest loss of life since the new Vandenberg campaign during the Reunification War a battle that had raged for many months. In the subsequent years, a further 60 million civilians perished in the nuclear winter, and another 20 million were displaced by the carnage. In May of 2788, it was unquestionably one of the greatest atrocities in human history. By year's end, those numbers would be almost insignificant. Back in the Federated Suns, Operation Solar Shield was getting underway. It began with the botched assault on Elbar that May. Upon arrival, they failed to locate any hostile naval presence, and so began their burn towards orbit, only for a Combine warship to suddenly appear behind them and destroy their jump ships. The stranded dropships transferred as much of their material into their escort as possible, before cruising straight past their target, abandoning their vessels, and jumping out in the days that followed. Shadar was an even greater disaster. While the two Vincent-class corvettes engaged each other, the DCA destroyers completely ignored the incoming fire from the remaining escort warship to focus on the approaching dropships. Yet another AFFS regiment was destroyed before even making landfall, as were the naval elements soon after. To help pull some of the attention away from the Terran end of the front, 
John Davian had ordered those forces who had retreated deeper into the Fairfax combat region to instead squeeze the Curate in advance from the other end. The final target in the ill-fated Operation Solar Shield was Cartago, where the strength of Alexander were making landfall in early June. With them was the First Prince himself. A pair of warships served as escort for the assault force, and were able at first to drive off their opposite number from the Draconis Combine Admiralty. The Davian guards descended to secure the capital's spaceport, but found it strangely deserted. The ships around them were civilian designs, not military as they had first appeared. They were also in serious disrepair. The mystery resolved itself when the Draconis Combine remote detonated a nuclear weapon hidden among the vessels. John Davian's saving grace was that the detonation was somewhat premature, and only a company of mechs were caught in the explosion. It had nonetheless shaken his composure, and he ordered his regiment back to their dropships when they detected a large aerospace fighter force on fast approach. At the same time, a trio of Curitan destroyers now moved around the planet to engage their escort and cut off their exit. Miraculously, the First Prince was able to escape the system alive, but only thanks to a holding action that lost him yet another warship. Operation Solar Shield was an unmitigated disaster for the Federated Suns. If there was any silver lining at all, it was that the Field Marshals at Fairfax had actually managed to liberate most of their combat region. Elsewhere, the best victory they could claim was the death of the Coordinator's cousin Vincent Curita, whose claim to the new Avalon throne had begun the War of Davian succession half a century earlier. The main Combine advance continued unabated, however. In less than two years, the Draconis March had been halved in size. By the end of 2788, more than 25 regiments had been destroyed by the Curitan tidal wave, almost a quarter of their pre-war strength. A few battalion-sized units had formed behind enemy lines on Dobson, Franklin and New Roads, and miraculously, Colonel Michael Barlow's battalion was still fighting on Cusser, as were some of the survivors on Galtor, despite being two of the first worlds hit. The Dragon now sat directly on the border of the Crucis March. This region of space had not seen combat since the Davian Civil War two and a half centuries earlier. It had seemed unthinkable that another realm would ever push so far into their territory. Morale across the military was absolutely shot. And unfortunately for House Davian, Kirita was only just getting started. Earlier in the year, Jerome Blake had returned from his voyage with promises from each of the successor lords to respect Comstar's neutrality. The conditions of the Communications Protocol of 2787 were already being enforced across the Inner Sphere. Back on March 13th, he had outlined his plans for a revised Operation Silver Shield. The situation in the Terran hegemony was more dire than ever. Though it was only a suspicion at the time, Documents recovered in the years since prove that both Minoru Kurita and Kenyan Malik were already making plans for an assault on Terra. Blake had strengthened his forces by approaching mercenaries of SLDF Vintage and offering them spare parts stockpiles, but he now called for his full power. Operation Silver Shield began on June 25th at 0600 Terra Standard Time. Every hyperpulse generator within the Sol system suddenly went dark and this soon spread to the entire network, cutting off all interworld communications. Without a means to contact their neighbours, nobody realised this was anything more than a local failure and not a deliberate act. This shutdown was timed to coincide with the arrival of former SLDF troops on Terra. Comstar had secretly organised its forces into eight expeditionary brigades under the command of General Lauren Hayes, their first targets were the space defense system emplacements, securing the world against all but the largest hostile fleets. The small garrisons maintained by each successor state were promptly disarmed. Only the AFFS garrison at Berlin resisted for five hours. Elsewhere in the Sol system, the warships Comstar had hidden quickly brought the other planets and facilities under their control. With Comstar and Blake in particular viewed in such a favorable light by the Terrans, the government welcomed the takeover. 
The only stubborn resistance Hayes faced was a pair of former SLDF divisions that refused to go along with their orders. Operating out of the Manaus Castle Brian, they fought for three days until the 1st and 5th Comstar Expeditionary Division were able to overrun their position. The HPGs came back online on the 28th, carrying a message across the Inner Sphere, informing them of the events on Earth. Terra had been claimed as a Comstar Protectorate. The successor lords reacted with indignation, claiming that Comstar had violated its own neutrality. Unfortunately for them, with the First Succession War in full swing, they would need the continued support of the HPG network in order to complete their own campaigns before they could divert sufficient forces to seize Terra as their own. The original plan for Operation Silver Shield had called for Comstar to take control of all of the Hegemony core worlds, but Blake wisely saw that this would surely provoke a hostile reaction. Instead, the Comstar Expeditionary Divisions moved to New Earth on July 3rd, and began to dismantle the former regular army headquarters there. By the time they left a week later, there was nothing of use left. This would be the last time Comstar took overt military action in the First Succession War. They spent the next few decades securing their position politically on Terra, while trying to make themselves less of a target for the successor states by decommissioning their naval yards and secreting their many weapon stockpiles somewhere on Earth. Hunting for hidden Star League caches was becoming a popular pastime for every major house. The Draconis Combine had left Helm empty-handed, but they weren't the only ones searching within the Free Worlds League for one of Kerensky's abandoned stockpiles. In July, the armed forces of the Capellan Confederation and Lyran Commonwealth both dispatched a pair of regiments to the former provincial capital, Tierfing. The planet had been heavily scarred during the Civil War, and over the ensuing decade, over a billion civilians had emigrated off-world. Nevertheless, the ruined Castle's Brian likely still housed valuable supplies and equipment, making it a priority target. Rumours suggested that Marek was trying to bring the space defence system back into operation, which gave them additional urgency to strike sooner rather than later. The defending regiment excelled in ambush tactics, inflicting a heavy toll on the raiders. However, with 4 to 1 odds, there could be little hope of victory, even if the attackers were occasionally forced to fight each other. Colonel Sullivan sent out a call for reinforcements. To buy themselves time, the Marek militia turned to weapons of mass destruction, particularly favouring chemical weapons recovered from the ruins. This devastated the conventional forces deployed to Tierfing, turning the campaign into an all battle mech affair. Orient SR reinforcements arrived in the following weeks, but the situation soon became even more convoluted. Desperate to find anything that might help them turn the tide against the Kiritan onslaught, a Davian raiding party touched down in August. Their sizable infantry complement faced immediate disaster when they disembarked into a radioactive and poisoned hellscape. Task Force Devlin's attack on New Delos had threatened to severely weaken the strong ties between House Manic and House Allison. The Grand Duchy of Orient had been their strongest and most loyal supporter, but the Captain General's inability to defend one of his own systems from the Capellan attacks, coupled with his need for the Duchy to send its own units into occupied space, was a bad look for Kenyan Manic in Parliament. He now sought vengeance against Liao beginning with the orbital bombardment of Ingersoll in July. The primary target was the dropship assembly yards, but the destruction soon spread to the popular holiday and tourist beaches nearby. Worse followed at New Canton in August. The Maddock flotilla did not land any forces to take the planet, just simply bombarded the major military, industrial and residential districts from space. The following month, they went after the supply depots at Outreach, and then conducted another firebombing campaign against Hall in November. Civilian deaths were in the hundreds of thousands, but that was barely a drop in the ocean compared to what the Inner Sphere was about to bear witness to. Back in October, the chaotic battle raging on Tierfing reached another level. With the arrival of the Draconis Combine Mustard Soldiery, Tierfing became the only time in history that a five-way battle had been fought between each of the successor states. In a notable twist of fate, 
two former units of the Rimworld's Republic would battle against one another, the Black Sharks and the Stealths. In December, fighting intensified as the eleven regiments closed on the Great Crystal Valley, one of the greatest natural wonders of the Inner Sphere, site of towering phosphorescent crystals as large as glaciers. Whole battalions would vanish into underground warrens, caves, and Star League bunkers scattered across the region, never to re-emerge. Alliances were formed and broken on an hourly basis. Two whole regiments were destroyed across the Six-Day Battle, and the crystal formations that predated humanity itself were trampled into dust. What little of value was found barely compensated for the material lost in its acquisition. The fighting continued into February 2789, at which point the survivors all pulled back. Another of the Terran hegemony's jewels had been thoroughly despoiled. The profligate use of nuclear and particularly chemical weapons had left it virtually uninhabitable. Tyrfing had suffered at the hands of Amaris during the Civil War, but the SLDF campaign had kept the use of WMDs to military targets primarily. The same was not true of the First Succession War. Less than 8 million civilians had survived to see the Great Houses depart. The final death toll, 1.6 billion. The blockade of Inglesmond had been going on for almost two years. It remained one of the most economically viable systems within the Terran hegemony but the situation on the ground was dire. The Combine hoped to starve the government into submission and claim the industrious planet for themselves. The inhabitants did not want to give up their freedoms to the draconian House Curita, but things were getting desperate. A request for aid went out to both the Federated Sons and Lyran Commonwealth, promising to join their realm in exchange for assistance in repulsing the dragon. Neither was in any position to help, but saw an opportunity to deny the Curitans another valuable system. When they arrived, their objective was simply asset denial. Inglesmond watched in horror as the troops that they believed had come to save them instead unleashed an array of nuclear weapons against them and any DTMS targets of opportunity. The enraged Combine responded in kind, leading to a cataclysmic fallout on the ground. When the dust settled and the Kiritans looked at what the battle had won them, they found nothing but ash. Of the once four and a quarter billion people that had called Inglesmond home, barely 10,000 anguished souls were left. Twenty-seven eighty-eight is the year where the First Succession War passes beyond easy comprehension. The Star League Civil War, which just a decade earlier was the bloodiest conflict ever fought, was now nothing but a prologue to the apocalypse which had been unleashed by the successor states. In two years, or on just one planet in the case of Inglesmund, more people had been killed in combat than in the entire 100,000 years of human history. And in the eyes of House Davian and Steiner High Command, that was a successful raid. The carnage being wrought all along their borders had so desensitized them to the use of weapons of mass destruction that the extermination of billions was now nothing but an unfortunate but necessary act to deny their true rival a valuable asset. Twenty-seven eighty-eight also marked the end for the Terran hegemony. When Comstar took over control of Terra and made no provision for the governance of other neighbouring systems, the former Cameron Worlds found themselves without a home nation. The effects were similar to the demarcation declaration that followed the Outer Reaches Rebellion half a millennia earlier. It would take a few more years for all of them to be subsumed into one of the successor states, but for all intents and purposes, the Terran hegemony was dead. Well, I said it was going to be a somber episode, and I meant it. This is unquestionably the darkest point in the timeline. There's never again a year quite as bad as this. 
I wish I could say it was over though. Next year, the successor states are going to do the exact same thing. And this isn't the last planet with a population in the billions to be completely wiped out. When I used this song in the past to conclude the reunification war, I thought it perfectly captured the mood I was going for showing those casualty graphs. And yet looking back, that is just a drop in the ocean compared to what has happened now. I bring up the reunification war because back when I was reading through the source book, there was one particularly vile character I wanted to shed more light on, and that was Amos Forlow. And it's been interesting, I feel like I see his name brought up more now than I did in the past as one of the truly evil people from the franchise's uh, history. Why is that important? Well, it's because in the first succession war, the one thing that will get mentioned more time than anything else is, of course, the Kintari Massacre. And yet, as important as that is, and as awful as it is, the loss of life is tiny compared to what happens in 2788. And yet these cataclysmic events so rarely get discussed. Tyrfing and Inglesmond, like I said, the first of several planets, which are going to suffer almost a complete loss. If this hasn't been enough of an emotional gut punch for you, and you can't wait until next Saturday for the next episode to come out, and you want to support the channel, you can head over to my Patreon now, it's linked in the description, and support me there, and you'll get access to the next couple episodes ahead of time. If you can't support me, don't worry about it, there's things you can do on YouTube, leave me a like, leave me a comment, I always try to respond to as many as I can, and particularly, share the video around. If you think you know people who might get a kick out of the series, Sharing it with them doesn't just bring one or two extra views to my channel, it actually acts as a boost in the algorithm uh, as YouTube decides to promote it a little bit more if it thinks people are talking about it. Thank you very much for watching me for this particularly dark episode. I will be back next weekend for Chapter 6, Sins of the Fathers.